If I could ask everyone to take their seats, please. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Um, I appreciate you taking the time on a otherwise busy Saturday before Christmas uh, to come out and spend the day with us. I know there are other things uh, that most of you could be doing, whether it's finishing end-of-term papers, revising for exams, doing Christmas shopping, or maybe binge-watching the second season of The Crown, which was released yesterday on Netflix. So thank you for uh, taking the time today. If you haven't yet had a chance to fill in one of the registration uh, forms at the, on the table at the entrance, please do so at the break, but I think it would be good if we got underway uh, now. My name is Father Jeffrey Reddy. I am co-director of the Orthodox School of Theology here at Trinity College, a member of the Faculty of Divinity here. And I would like to, before we do anything else, open us in prayer uh, this morning. Um, and I thought, in light of the fact that we are in the Advent season, preparing for the celebration of our Lord's saving nativity, that we could use a prayer from the service of nativity. This is one of the Sikera from the Vespers of Nativity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thy kingdom, O Christ our God, is a kingdom of all the ages, and thy rule is from generation to generation, made flesh of the Holy Spirit, and made man of the ever-Virgin Mary. Thou hast enlightened us by thy coming. Light of light, brightness of the Father, thou hast made the whole creation shine with joy. All that has breath praises thee, the image of the glory of the Father. O God, who art and hast ever been, who has shone forth from a virgin, have mercy on us. Amen. I'd now like to introduce our esteemed Dean here at the Faculty of uh, Divinity at Trinity College, Dean Christopher Britton. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's, I, I'm delighted to, to be able to be here this morning to uh, welcome you on behalf of Trinity College and the Faculty of Divinity here. Uh, it's a, this is a wonderful event. Um, I'm also very glad to uh, have a chance to, um, to uh, meet some of, uh, some of you who are students here who I have yet to meet, uh, and also to welcome those of you uh, who I only come across occasionally, given that uh, my, my primary engagement has been in teaching with, with the Anglican program. Uh, I'm, also, I'm very grateful to those who have made this event possible. Uh, to St. Mark's Orthodox Fellowship, particularly Dr. Rouf Edouard, uh, and uh, of course the members of the Orthodox School of Theology here at Trinity College, partic particularly our co-directors Richard Schneider and Father Jeffrey Reddy. So thank you to them. Welcome uh, very much, and this is a wonderful event. I've, I've known uh, certainly uh, uh, Professor Baer's work, but I was delighted to meet him in person on Thursday to have the opportunity to get to know him a little bit, and uh, we're in for a lovely day. I would also apologize. I can't be here for the entire day. I've got some friends getting ordained uh, here today in Toronto, and we'll need to go celebrate with them, but... Uh, I'll certainly enjoy being part of the lectures this morning, and uh, I'll uh, be eagerly in, uh, awaiting reports from you on how things have gone and how it stimulated your thoughts. So blessings to you all, and now uh, P Professor Richard Schneider will introduce our distinguished guest. both a particular pleasure and a particular privilege. Uh, the, ple the pleasure is that Father John and I have known each other, worked together, been friends for, it's going on 20 years now. Um, so I have the joy of telling a story from the inside out a little bit. Uh, the, pr the privilege is an ancient one. In, Ro in Roman times, when there was a great occasion, uh, there would be what was called a panegyric, which would be a a celebratory speech in honor of the great man. Well, that's in a sense what this is going to be, uh, and it's extremely well deserved because it's about 
in fact, someone who's, if I had to sum him up in one word, has been a game changer um, for all those, all those years, right, almost 30 now. Uh, whatever Father John does, it has an impact that wakes everybody up and alters the course of the way we, the way we think about subjects. Um, part of this is because um, his first training was not in theology, it was in philosophy. His first degree was in philosophy. And I think it's quite fascinating that he, wor he worked on a combination of Christian thought and Emmanuel Levinas, which shows he's right, right up there in postmodernism. This makes him a very rare bird in orthodox circles. And it has a considerable impact on the way he approaches work. Uh, he's acutely conscious in everything he does that we can't simply go back into the second century, the third century, the fourth century, and so on, that we are getting back there by way of a long tradition of understanding those periods, all of which has impacted the way we're going to think um, and the way we're going to see what they're trying to say. And yet, at the same time, and this is something he always tries to impart to students, and it's getting rarer and rarer these days, um, what he does say is always based on extremely close reading, very, very careful scrutiny of the text. Um, that's, that's an old and uh, responsible scholarly tradition uh, that in our day is, I'm sad to say, somewhat disappearing under waves and waves of the theory, ideology, and speculation. So the, co the combination has been extremely important. Um, <clears throat> his doctoral work was under Callisto Square, uh, the famous metropolitan Callisto Square at Oxford. And uh, right off the bat, uh, moved, it, moved attention back to the pre-Nicene Fathers, uh, who had been somewhat neglected. And um, we, we now, um, to a great extent, thanks to his work, realize the dynamism of the development of Christian thought in the years immediately after the gospel. Uh, the first book that was published was um, on anthropology and asceticism in Irenaeus and Clement, uh, published by Oxford University Press, 2000. Um, he is, I believe, the most published orthodox scholar from Oxford Press in history. That was the, that was the beginning of it. It was a version of his doctoral thesis. Um, <clears throat> he went um, to St. Vladimir Seminary. He was called the St. Vladimir Seminary in 1999, 1999 to, to um, I'm sorry, 1993 to teach uh, patristics. And uh, he has been there ever since, a long career. Um, the list of books is way too long to enumerate if I did that, I'd be here all day. Um, it's an average of about a book a year. Um, again, he brought Ir Irenaeus to the world's attention by um, his publication in what became, started to become the popular patristic series that I think everybody knows about now. It's almost 50 volumes. And it has, it has made um, these patristic texts available in English translation at a very reasonable price um, to call attention to the primary sources. Um, and what he put out was a little attended text by Irenaeus on the apostolic preaching. Uh, to do it, he had to learn Armenian, by the way. But then, um, this is an example of the game changing, uh, he put out an overview, an overview of the development of thought in the patristic period um, and the whole world knows about these books, the, um, the Road to Nicaea, The Way to Nicaea, and The Nicene Faith. Uh, we're still holding our breath waiting for the third volume, um, and we hope it will come out. Um, but what made these books game changers was that the whole approach to patrology changed. It became individuals all struggling with key questions of theology 
and the key questions of theology were focused on Christ and who Christ is. And it was not presented, as in the older tradition of Harnack and the handbooks, as a synthesis or a systematic development. It was dialogue and debate between individuals, struggle, um, attempts to cope, an ongoing process. Uh, it was really, really exciting and generated a lot of attention. But then he synthesized that into a book that I think uh, every Christian should have on their nightstand, The Mystery of Christ, in which he found the underlying theology and theological issues and theological outlooks which prompted that ongoing patristic debate. Um, you can see all these books uh, on our display table. Uh, I apologize, normally we have a book sale, but Crux Books, it's a sign of our times, has had to close because of underuse by theology students. And so what's on the table is for display only, but you can get the, you can order these books online from St. Vladimir Seminary Press, or of course from Amazon. Um, <clears throat> and the, he's continued to do that, along with editing the whole series, he's continued to do that. We've, today's talk is all centered around his translation of Athanasius' On the Incarnation. Uh, which came out five years ago. But then he publishes big books on um, scholarly problems, uh, again, often in renegade sort of people, text outliers like Diodor and Theodore. Uh, that came out in 2011. Uh, I'm happy to be able to announce that uh, his new translation of Origins on First Principles just appeared just a couple of weeks ago, so it will be on the bookshelves. This is a total game changer. Uh, we've, all, we've all been using for 50 years uh, a really badly edited and badly translated text of Origins on First Principles, and now finally we're going to have a responsible, reliable, wonderful text with a very fine 150-page introduction. Um, he's currently at work on a book called John the Theologian, uh, which is an examination of where this theological debate starts. It starts with the Gospel of John and the writings of John. Um, but there is, of course, a pun in the title. And the pun reflects, it's a serious pun, because it reflects exactly that principle of uh, we, com we come to theology through the whole tradition of reading and interpretation and grasp and meaning, and we have to find a way to work our way back through that tradition. It's a very postmodern approach to what it means to read a text. Um, Father John um, comes from a long and distinguished family of priests. His great-grandfather was uh, the first Russian Orthodox missionary in England. Uh, he has um, monastics in his family, uh, theologians, men and women. Um, the family tree is extensive. Um, and uh, while I was warned that, I, that uh, I should follow a tradition and not mention this, he also happens to be um, an expert on antique bicycles. And, in, and, in, and if you go down in his basement, you will see some real treasures. And he's also himself an avid cyclist. Um, there's an annual hiatus in his family life in which the whole family stops and watches the Tour de France for three weeks. Um, it's a great privilege for us to have Father Bear here. Uh, so I present to you the George Florovsky, Distinguished Professor of Patristics from St. Vladimir Seminary, uh, and also um, the Professor of Patristics, I've forgotten the title of the chair, uh, the Bishop Callistos Professor from Amsterdam, from the University, from Amsterdam, uh, Father John Baer. <laughs> Okay, this is on. 
Um, thank you very much for the invitation, for the event, for the words of introduction. It should be very much appreciated. Um, as you can gather, as Richard told, uh, Professor Schneider told you, I'm, I'm from England. I've been here for 25 years or so, but as you can hear, I've still got my English accent. Um, if it's a problem, put your hand up if I'm not making myself clear. I realise that having kept my English accent is to my advantage because I know that whatever I, I've been told, whatever I say sounds intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, it's, you know, it's a saving grace in that respect. Okay. Um, as Professor Schneider mentioned, uh, I've been working on the Fathers for some 30 plus years uh, before my doctoral work and with my doctoral work under Callisus and so on. And I have to say, I'm finding it ever more difficult. Yeah? You would think that reading the Fathers year in, year out, I've probably read this text at least twice a year for the last 30 years, and you would think I perhaps know it by now. But actually, it becomes ever more difficult. And I realise that one of the most important things we can do, as I can do as a teacher, do it with my students back at St. Vladimir's in Amsterdam, we do it today, is just reflect on what it means to learn to read a text. Okay? So when I was invited to come here, we spoke about what we could do, and I suggested that we actually simply take, we're coming up to the nativity period, that we simply take this text, I asked that everybody read it beforehand, and that we then go through it. I realise not everybody's got their copy, so I prepared a list of some quotations from it. And to actually just pay attention to what, it, what is going on in it. We all think we know theology. We all think we know, you know, Trinity, Incarnation, how it all holds together, the systematic theology. And then we read early texts and we find, yes, he's already saying this, he's already saying that, and so on. But the more I read this text especially, the more perplexed I become. Really. And two things. And I'm going to be asking you questions, OK? So I, I want this to be a bit, bit more interactive. I don't want to just be lecturing and just, just talking and you sitting there passively and listening. I'm going to ask you questions. What do we mean by incarnation? How many times do we talk about the incarnation, especially students of theology? We talk about the incarnation all the time. We're coming up to the feast of the incarnation and so on. What do you mean? became flesh, and we're talking about John 1.14, and 1.14, we would then say that it's John 1.14, the word became flesh, this is when Jesus is born of Mary. Yeah? Something like that. Does John 1.14 talk about a birth? Just as a matter of fact, does it talk about a birth? No. Do the infancy narratives in Matthew and Luke, talking about Mary giving birth to Jesus, do they talk about the word of God? So what are we doing putting them together like that? Yeah, okay. So there's something uh, to reflect on. Um, this is the first book called On the Incarnation, the first book devoted to this very topic, written by St. Athanasius the Great, the great defender of Nicaea. What does he mean by incarnation here? Yeah, we all think, well, we know what he is meant by incarnation, therefore this is what he's talking about. Is it? And if it's not, what are we talking about and where do we get that from? Okay. The second reason why reading a text like this is so difficult is because it's, in some level, so familiar to us. We all know what this book says. It says, he became man that we might become God. Yeah, we all know that's what Athanasius says in this. Where does he say it in this? Chapter 54. What is chapter 54? What part of the work is it located in? What's he doing when he gets to chapter 54? How's the work structured? Is this the conclusion of his work? Is it the centre of his work? If not, why have we reduced this work to this passing statement? Yeah, in other words, we're not reading the work. Yeah, we think we know what, the, what, what incarnation is. We think we know what he says in it because we've heard it so many times. And then we stop reading the actual work itself. So what I want to do today is to simply go through this work. We're not going to go through every page, obviously, but we're going to look at the key structure. We're going to look at what it's doing. We're, and hopefully through all of that, we're going to come to some understanding of what he might mean by incarnation. 
what he's talking about, how he's talking about, how this work works, and so on. Okay? Are you ready? Yeah? Okay, so let's start off. Chapter 1 of On the Incarnation. In what which is the first quotation you sheet, okay? In what preceded, we have sufficiently treated a few points and many regarding the error of the Gentiles concerning idols and their superstitions, how the invention was from the beginning, that out of the wickedness human beings devised from themselves the worship of idols. By the grace of God, we also noted a few points regarding the divinity of the Word, of the Father, and the, of the Father, and his providence and power in all things, that through him the good Father arranges all things, by him all the things are moved and in him are given life. Come now, blessed one, true love of Christ, let us next with, our f with the faith of our religion relate also the things concerning the incarnation of the Word, expand its divine manifestation to us, which the Jews slander the Greeks mock, but we ourselves venerate, so that all the more from his apparent degradation you may have an ever greater, more fuller piety towards him. For the more he's mocked by unbelievers, by so much more he proves a greater witness of his divinity, because what humans cannot understand is impossible, these he shows to be possible. What human beings mock at as unseemly, these he renders fitting by his own goodness. What human beings thought of as sophistry, uh, through sophistry laugh at as merely human, these by his power shows to be divine. Overturning the illusions of idols by his own apparent degradation through the cross, invisibly persuading those who mock and disbelieve to recognise his divinity and power. Okay? So what's the first thing you should get from this, from the opening words? Okay, I'm asking, I want, I want interaction, I'm not going to simply tell you all the answers, but, uh, because I want to actually get you in the habit of reading. What's the first thing you should get from the opening words? Beware of idols. No. No. There is a book that came before. <laughs> yeah. In what preceded? Okay, so it's a two-part work. Yeah, and he tells you what he did in the first part of the work, yeah? But the first part, it's a, it's a two-part work. You can't just jump over that. So we've now got to go back to the first part of the work to see what's happening in the first part of the work, to which the second part is responding. Okay? He gives us a very brief illustration of what's going on in the first part by saying about idols and so on, but there are many other things that we need to actually examine in that first part of the work. Okay, so the quotation uh, number two is from the opening paragraph of um, Contragentes against the pagans. Um, he actually starts off, just to give you a... a the background, it's not immediately starting with but. He starts off by saying that although the knowledge of religion and the truth can be learned without human teachers, um, since it's revealed every day, shining more brightly than the sun through the teaching of Jesus Christ, yet as we've been asked to expound a little of the Christian faith, we will do so. And then he continues, but since we do not have, because of quotation number two on your sheet, but since we do not have the work of these teachers to hand, we must expound for you in writing what we have learnt from them. I mean, the faith in Christ, the Saviour, so that. Let's just leave it at that for now. What do we get from the first two lines? That we don't have the work of the teachers at hand. Okay, now what do we do with that? We have to assume that he is synthesizing. So one of the great paradoxes about the work on the Incarnation, Contradiction on the Incarnation, is it never mentions Arius. Okay, the Arian controversy broke out 318, 322. So you've got the question, did he write it before the Arian controversy broke out? Which would have meant he would have been a teenager. Yeah, early 20s perhaps, be really young. Okay. Or did he write it much later? But if it's much later, why not mention Arius? Because the Arian struggle continued thereafter in the 30s and so on. So some people would say, since we do not have these works of the teachers to hand, he must have, this must be a reference to him being in exile in Trier. He was exiled most of his Episcopal life. You know, he was always in trouble for one thing or another. Um, he spent a long, long time in exile. One of the times he's in exile, he's in Trier. And so perhaps this is early 330s, 333, 334, that kind of time. So perhaps this is a reference to the work being written at that point while he's in exile and does not have the works of the teachers to hand. Okay, that's, that's a way a lot of people would take it. 
Um, and it comes to the very question of what's going on in these works. That's why I'm labouring with it now. How else could it be taken? Since we do not have these works... So if he's not in exile... Okay, that's a possible interpretation. But if he's not in exile, how else could it be taken? Well, since we do not have the works of these teachers to hand. Okay, what I think is going on, and I'll explain why as we go through, what I think is going on is that, no, in fact, we've got these writings to hand, but he doesn't think much of them. And so what he's doing is saying, yeah, we've got these writings, but don't read them, read this. Okay, and the writings in question would be Eusebius of Caesarea. Okay, and that would help us locate the date of the work. And I'm, I'm following Carlo Danatolius in this. The, the date of the work is in the years immediately following uh, the Council of Nicaea. Arius has been vanquished. It's only in 338, 328, 339 that he gets brought back by Constantine. But in those years immediately following, it seems the problem is over and done with. He doesn't need to mention it. But what's happening at this point is that Eusebius is now praising Constantine for having brought peace to the whole world. Yeah? And what Athanasius is doing is saying, no, it's not Constantine who brought peace, it's Christ who brought peace. Yeah? So there's a, there's a battle going on in, 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 in regard to this. And so his emphasis is that all the demons have been put to flight, all idolatry has been overthrown, by the work of Christ, not by Constantine. Yet Constantine might have been a mediator for that, but it's not his work, it's Christ's work. Okay? Um, together with the fact that Eusebius of Caesarea, there are real difficulties with his theology. It's much more kind of sympathetic towards the Arians than Athanasius is. And so he's saying, but Eusebius is the respected teacher. You know, he, he's 80, 90 years old. He's written more than anybody else. He's done all these things. He's the respected teacher. Athanasius is just newly, after the Council of Constantine uh, in Nicaea, he's newly appointed as a bishop. Yeah, bishop um, Alexander dies, 326. He's appointed 327. He's still very young. He's got to establish his credentials. He's writing this handbook of Christian theology, this simple book presentation, and he's saying, this is what you should be looking at. Don't look at Eusebius. Okay, that's what's going on, I think, in these passages, the opening there. But let's carry on. Since, but, so, uh, question number two. But since we do not have the works of these teachers to hand, we must, we must expand for you in writing what we've learned from them. This is a takeaway which you should get from them anyway. Yeah? I mean, the faith in Christ the Saviour. That no one may regard our, the teaching of our doctrine, Logos, as worthless, or suppose faith in Christ to be irrational, our Logos. Such things are pagans misrepresent and scorn, greatly mocking us, though they have nothing other than the cross of Christ to cite an objection. It's particularly in this respect that one must pity their insensitivity, because in slandering the cross, they do not see that its power has filled the whole world, and that through it the effects of the knowledge of God have been revealed to all. For if they had really applied their minds to his divinity, they would not have mocked at so great a thing but would rather have recognised that he was the saviour of the universe. And the cross, not Constantine, the cross was not the ruin but the healing of creation. For if after the cross, this emphasis on uh, the, the cross is the defining point in all of this, if after the cross all idolatry has been overthrown, all demonic activities put to flight by this sign, and Christ alone is worshipped, and through him the Father's known, and the opponents put to shame, while he every day invisibly converts their soul. It's all Christ and the cross that's doing this, not Constantine. Yeah? If, if all this is happening through Christ and the cross, then how, one might reasonably ask them, is this matter still to be considered in human terms? And should one not rather confess that he who ascended the cross is the word of God and the saviour of the universe? Okay, so we establish it's a two-part work. This is part one. And this is the opening paragraph of part one. 
What does he say this work is going to be? What does he say this work is going to be? What's he going to do in this work? It's, it's, it's focused on the cross, isn't it? He's going to show, it's really interesting, that last line, the order of the words. He's going to show that the one who ascended the cross is the word of God. Notice the order of identification. It's the one on the cross who we're confessing as the word of God. Yeah, it's fundamentally that way round. And because we confess this one to be the word of God, the logos of God, the Christian faith is not a logos, without a word, irrational. Yeah? So the whole thing is, in fact, an apology for the cross. The one on the cross is the word of God, therefore the Christian faith is not without a word, a logos, therefore you cannot say it's irrational. And it's specifically this one at the cross. If after the cross all idolatry has been overthrown, all demonic activity has been put to flight, Christ alone is worshipped, this is the defining moment in all of it. Yeah? And this is what he's saying he's doing in these two works. Part one is contra gentes against pagans, part two is on the incarnation. Yeah? So both of these works are oriented towards this. Okay? So it becomes really surprising, for instance, when somebody like um, Richard Hansen, who's a great patristic scholar in the 1980s and 1990s, he wrote a huge book, some 600 pages, called The Search for the Christian Doctrine of God. Look at the 4th century theology. And he wrote of Athanasius. He says, one of the curious results of this theology of the incarnation, he's talking about this work, is that it almost does away with the doctrine of the atonement. Of course, Athanasius believes in the atonement, in Christ's death as saving, but he cannot really explain why Christ should have died at all. The fact is that his, his doctrine of the incarnation has almost swallowed up any doctrine of the atonement, has made it unnecessary. Yeah? In other words, Hansen is starting with the idea which we all had at the beginning of this talk about what incarnation is. Second person of Trinity becoming man, becoming flesh, born of Mary. That's incarnation. And we all know that this work is, he became man that we might become God. And we say, well, where's the cross in that? Yeah, he became man that we might become God. But now we've actually seen that the whole work, the two-part work, is in fact presented and understood by the author as a defense of the cross, a defense of the rationality of the cross. The one on the cross is the word of God. Yeah? He doesn't say the word of God became man and then did, 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 and then went up the cross. The one on the cross is the word of God, and therefore the Christian faith is not allogos. Is that clear? So he's doing something very different than we might have thought to begin with. Okay. Um, what I want to do is to go through a couple of passages from Contra Gentes, and then perhaps we'll take the break, and then we'll turn to On the Incarnation itself. Okay? Because what, if it's part one and part two, what he does in part one is essential to understanding what's happening in part two. Okay? Now, as it becomes clear from that quotation number one on your sheet there, um, he's understanding the cross as being the center of all of this, and the cross has put all idolatry, has overthrown all idolatry, has put all demonic activity to flight, and has persuaded all to worship Christ. If only we apply our minds to it, we would not have mocked at it. So it's not just simply a matter of seeing the cross. You see the cross and you mock. Yeah? But if you apply your minds properly to it, this is in fact what you will see. Okay? So it's also a defense of using your mind to see this. Yeah? Seeing it in and of itself doesn't do anything. It's using your mind to see it. Okay, so he, he sets it up as um, the work of Christ on the cross is to overthrow uh, idolatry and demonic activity. Purge the world of all of that, turn everybody towards Christ. So at the beginning of Contra Gentis, after the introductory paragraph, he explains how all of this problem has arisen. And it's fascinating to see how he does it. 
So quotation number two. He says, this is directly continuing on, uh, quotation number three, continuing on for quotation number two. Contragentes one, contragentes two. Evil has not existed from the beginning, nor even now is it found among the holy ones, nor does it exist at all with them. But it was human beings who later began to conceive of it and imagine it in their own likeness. Hence they fashioned for themselves a notion of idols, reckoning what was not as though it were. For God, the creator of the universe, king of all, who is beyond all being and human thought, since he is good and exceedingly noble, he has made the human race according to his own image, through his own word, our saviour Jesus Christ. He also fashioned the human being to be perceptive and understanding of reality through his similarity to himself, giving him also a conception and knowledge of his own eternity, so that preserving this identity he might never abandon his concept of God or leave the company of the Holy Ones, but retaining the grace of him who bestowed it, having also God's own power from the paternal word, he might rejoice and converse with the divine, leading an idyllic and truly blessed and immortal life. For having no obstacles to the knowledge of the divine, he continuously contemplates by his purity the image of God the, uh, of the Father, God the Word, after whose image he was made. He's awestruck when he grasps a providence which, through the Word, extends to the universe, being raised above every sensual and every bodily appearance, cleaving instead by the power of his mind to the divine and intelligible realities in heaven. For when the mind of human beings has no intercourse with the body, nor mingled with it from outside anything of their desires, but is entirely above them as it was in the beginning, then transcending the senses and all human things, it's raised up on high, and beholding the word, sees in him also the father of the word, taking pleasure in contemplating him and being renewed by its desire for him. Just as the Holy Scriptures say of the first created human beings, who was called Adam in Hebrew, that at the beginning he had his mind fixed on God in an, in an unembarrassed boldness, and lived with the holy ones in a contemplation of intelligible reality, which he enjoyed in that place which holy Moses figuratively called paradise. So purity of soul is sufficient to reflect and behold through itself God, as the Lord himself said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay, it's the opening chapter after the introduction. What's he doing? Why is he doing it? What's he saying? <laughs> students at St. Adam get really, really frustrated with me because I ask questions like that and they, you know, they think I'm after a really high, sophisticated, theological, methodological answer with, and they try and give that to me. It always fails. I'm a much, much more pedestrian thinker just down here. What is he doing in this passage? We just read it. He's trying to say that we can apply our mind to the cross because the mind can yeah, so, yeah, yes it can, but, but more than that, what's he doing in this passage, and how and why? Why does he start off, evil has not existed from the beginning? Um, perhaps he's trying to avoid any uh, realistic uh, understanding. Right, so we're the ones who... Invented evil by... Ter so we were created for contemplating God through his word. Okay, that's what we're done, yeah? Notice, very, very, it's really striking how he says he, he made the human race according to his own image, through his own word, our saviour, Jesus Christ. Yeah? He created the world and the human race through his, our saviour, Jesus I've we, Almost everybody will think in terms of God creating everything through the pre-incarnate word. I've never found the phrase pre-incarnate word in the Fathers. I find it all the time in modern scholarship, modern theology, but never in the Fathers. Okay? The point is, we're talking about Christ, and he's the one by whom God created. Just like we see in the Creed. One God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, who, 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 who. Okay? So creation is through and not just simply Jesus Christ, but through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. He's created all of this. So is he describing uh, cosmological beginnings? Is he describing, is he doing history? Is he explaining what happened at the beginning? Is he interpreting Genesis? 
Is he, is he instead giving us a, an analysis of what we are created to do? And what we're created to do is to be in the image of the word, Jesus Christ, and through him contemplate the Father. But what we've done from the beginning is turn away from that. We've turned away from that. We've turned to that which is not. We've given that which is not existence. We've conjured up idols. We've made evil and all the rest of it. Yeah? So it's very important to, know, to see what key it is he's doing. He's not doing it in terms of creation, fall, salvation history, then incarnation, as we tend to do it. Yeah? He's already talking about our Savior Jesus Christ in this passage. Okay? And then most strikingly, by the time we get to the end, having, having, having gone through all of this, we were created to contemplate, in the image of our Saviour Jesus Christ, contemplate, uh, created to contemplate the Word, and through the Word come to knowledge of the Father, and live in this unembarrassed boldness of purity towards God, and so on. <coughs> um, he continues at the end, in the last four lines there, just as you can see in the Holy Scriptures, the first created human being who was called Adam in Hebrew, at the beginning, had his mind fixed on God. So he turns to the scripture afterwards, and he brings in Adam as an example of the truth he's saying. Yeah? He's not starting off with Genesis and Adam and this, that, and the other. He's starting off with what we are created to be in the light of our Savior Jesus Christ, and you can also see this is a case from Adam. Yeah? And notice what he does even more. So he says, just as the Holy Scriptures say that the that the first created of human beings, who was called Adam in Hebrew, at the beginning had his mind fixed on God in unembarrassed boldness, and lived with the holy ones uh, in the contemplation of intelligible reality which he enjoyed in that place which the holy Moses figuratively called paradise. Yeah? Moses' description of paradise is figurative because it's not being in a geographical place that enables you to see God in this unembarrassed boldness of purity, and, and so on and so on. So he carries on. Uh, so so uh, the Holy Moses figuratively called paradise. So purity of soul is sufficient to reflect and behold God, uh, behold uh, uh, through itself God, as the Lord himself said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's not blessed are those who managed to find Eden in the east, a garden planted somewhere else. Yeah? Eden is a figurative description of the state of purity of heart which enables us to see God, which is the truth for which we are created, which we're called into existence. Yeah? So he's not doing a reading of the Bible, starting with Genesis, starting with creation, then turning to the fall, and then doing this, that, and the other, and the other, and then finally coming to the incarnation, and then later on turning to uh, the crucifixion. Okay? The whole thing is written as an apology for the cross, and in order to explain the one on the, why the one on the cross is the word of God. He's got to show that everything else is idolatry and demonic activity, which we have brought into existence because we've turned our mind away from our proper task, which is to contemplate God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. That makes sense? Yeah? This is why it's important to be <laughs> the first work. So he then carries on, top of the next page, quotation number four. He says, in this way then, so it's, it's literally, it's, and the, the first three chapters of the work contradicts are the most important, and then it gets into, it's actually really boring, which is why I didn't translate it and put it here, a long history of pagan idolatry, you know, drawn upon all sorts of examples from, I don't know, Homer and whatever else it might be, and you know, pages and pages of you know, people worshipping cats and cows and whatever else it might be, yeah. But, but there the, are the, the few passages at the very beginning, in the middle and at the end, that are really heavy theological ones, and they're the ones we're looking at. Okay. So, creation number four, chapter three, and uh, continuing directly on. So he says, In this way then, as has been said, did the Creator fashion the human race, and as such did he wish it to remain. But human beings, contemptuous of the better things, and shrinking from their apprehension, sought rather what was closer to themselves. And what was close to themselves was the body and its sensation. So they turned their minds away from intelligible reality and began to consider themselves. 
And by considering themselves and holding to the body and the other senses and deceived in their own things, they fell into desire for themselves and preferring their own things to the contemplation of divine things. Spending their time in these things and being unwilling to turn away from things close at hand, they imprisoned in bodily pleasures their souls which had become disordered and mixed up with all kinds of desires, while they wholly forgot the power they received from God in the beginning. Okay. Um, we'll carry into the next paragraph in a minute. Now, it's very important to note, it's not as is often said for early Christian fathers, for the Alexandrians in particular, the mind is a true human person, the body somehow attached to it. Yeah? As is often character, some kind of platonic dualism and whatever else it might be. No, we are created to use our mind to contemplate God. That's what's distinctively human. It's what separates us from inanimate matter, from vegetables, from animals, you know, is a matter with different kinds of power of life in it. Well, our, the power of life that we've been given is a rational power to think and perceive, and, and, and we're to live for that. It doesn't mean that we're that alone, but everything should be ordered towards that. Yeah? To paraphrase Paul, or to put it slightly around, we should be eating in order to live, not living in order to eat. Yeah? We should be eating enough that sustains our body so that we can do what is proper for us as rational, intelligent beings. Okay? But what we've done from the beginning is to turn it around. Okay? And so he says, what we've done from the beginning, we sought rather what was closer to ourselves. And what was closer to them was the body and its sensation. In a sense, the body is more immediately ours. Our mind is like a faculty of orientation. Which way are we looking? Are we looking towards God, or are we looking towards the body? Yeah, the body is what's ours. Yeah, so it, there's absolutely no platonic dualism going on here. It's what are we, which way are we looking? Are we looking towards God as embodied beings, eating in order to live, live, living by contemplating God, or have we turned that upside down, and are we contemplating the body? Okay. And as soon as we contemplate the body, we, give, um, we fall into the desires of the body. They become ends in themselves. We start living in order to eat, to put it that way around. Yeah? So, and he carries on again, the second paragraph here, going back to, back to Adam. We can also see that this was so from the first created man. Okay, so he's bringing in Adam again as an example of the truth that he's teaching. He's not doing history. He's bringing it in as an example of the truth that he's teaching. We could also see it's also from the first created man as the Holy Scriptures relate of him. For he also, as long as he fixed his mind on God and contemplation of him, kept away from the contemplation of the, of the body. But when by the counsel of the serpent he abandoned his thinking of God, and began to consider himself, then they fell into the desire of the body and knew they were naked and knowing were ashamed. It's a really interesting sentence. A fascinating sentence. Look how it goes from the singular to the plural. Yeah? When he um, abandoned his thinking of God and began to consider himself, then they fell into the desire of the, of the body knowing naked and not ashamed. It's almost like once we turn our attention away from God, we fall into plurality. Yeah? We fall into plurality because we're now falling into uh, ourselves individually and the desires of our body and all the other kind of things. We find ourselves in warring in competition. Okay? So we end, we end up doing all of that. So they fell in this way. They knew that they were not so much naked of clothing, that, but they become naked of contemplation of divine things and that they turn their minds in the opposite direction. For abandoning the consideration of and desire for the one and the real, I mean God, from then on they gave themselves up to the various and separate desires of the body. So we're falling into uh, a state of fragmentation, basically. Turning away from God, which would unite us all together as one, that they may be one even as we are one. Turning away from that into the, turning attention to ourselves, our body, we fall into the desires of the body, we fall into fragmentation. OK? 
speaking. And in this way, uh, he would say, idolatry and evil arises. We give existence to that which has no existence in, our, in itself. Okay? We start to worship alligators and cats and whatever else it might be that he gets from pagan history, all the different examples. We fall into all the desires, we fall into um, murder, we fall into warring factions and all the kind of things that human history is full of. Okay? And that he charts thereafter for the next uh, 30 odd chapters. Um, just a couple of, so th that, that's the main problem that he sets up in part one that part two is then meant to uh, address. Yeah? So part two is not simply a separate treatise on what we think the term incarnation might be. It's a response to part one. Yeah? The whole thing is set as an apology for the cross. If we truly apply our minds, we can see that the one on the cross is the word of God. Therefore, Christian faith is not alogos, irrational, without reason. And the way he's going to show that it's not alogos, that the one on the cross is the word of God, is by contrasting the idolatry before the cross, worship of the cross after. Against the pagans, incarnation. So what does incarnation now mean? Okay. Something more is going on. The more you read, the more complex it becomes. Okay, so there are just a couple of other passages um, from the rest of Contra Gentis, which I just want to read, uh, go through with you, where he does um, there's something a bit more, there's two passages, in fact, five and six, we'll leave seven. So having gone through 30 or 40 chapters of pagan mythology, uh, quotation number five, he says, the pious religion must be ours, and the only true God, he whom we worship and preach, must be the Lord of all creation and the demiurge of all existence. Who then is this, if not the all-holy Father of Christ, beyond all created beings, who as supreme steersman through his own wisdom and his own word, our Lord and Saviour Christ? Again, the wisdom and the word by which he's governing all of creation is Christ. Yeah, not a pre-incarnate word or anything like that. Word and wisdom are titles of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, guides and orders all the universe for our salvation and acts as seems best to him. For the movement of creation was meaningless, our logos, and the universe was carried around haphazardly, one could well disbelieve our statements. But if it's created with logos, wisdom and understanding, and has been arranged in complete order, then he who governs and orders the universe can be none other than the word of God, our Lord, Saviour, Christ. Okay? So again, a, he's looking at the whole of creation in Christic terms. Not, not a pre-incarnate word governing everything. The Lord and Saviour Christ is the one who's arranging and governing and keeping all things in harmony. And this is made even more emphatic in quotation number six, which is actually one of the first full reflective statements about creation ex nihilo. And it's fascinating that that occurs in a work which is, in fact, dedicated as an apology for the cross. Yeah? Simone Petremont, in one of her books, points out that the cross separates, as well as unites, it separates God and creation far more radically than any notion of creation might do. Yeah? The cross is what really shows God's ways to be not our ways and at the same time unites the two most effectively. Okay. So that's perhaps why we've got this reflection on creation ex nihilo here. So quotation number six, just a little bit on from quotation number five, chapter 41. And the cause why the word of God really came to created beings is truly wonderful and shows that things could not have occurred otherwise than as they are. That's a theme we're going to see repeatedly in the Incarnation. Things could not have happened otherwise than they did. Yeah? It, it makes some really dramatic statements in, in, on the Incarnation. But what's happening now is that he's using the language of the Word of God coming to creation, which is a language that you have from Incarnation. You're now applying it to cosmology. Yeah? So the, the pattern of the coming of the Word of God, the one on the cross, is now applied to cosmology as a whole. 
Yeah? The reason why the Word of God really came to created beings is truly wonderful. He carries on. For the nature of created beings, having come into being from nothing, is unstable and is weak and mortal when considered by itself. So in and of itself, created being is caught, brought into being from nothing and is always tending back towards nothingness. It's always in this, in this tension. But the God of all is good and excellent by nature. Therefore, he also loves humankind. For a good being would be envious of no one. So he envies nobody existence, but rather wishes everyone to exist in order to exercise his kindness. So seeing that all created nature according to its own definition, is in a state of flux and dissolution. Everything's in inherently dissolving. Everything that comes into being passes away. We're always in that flux. But he says, therefore, lest it suffer this, and the universe be dissolved back into non-being, making everything by his own eternal word and giving substance to creation, he did not abandon it to be carried away and be tempest-tossed through its own nature, lest it run the risk of returning to nothing. But being good, he governs and establishes the whole world through his word, who is himself God, in order that creation, illumined by the leadership of providence and ordering of the word, may be able to remain firm, the amenim, to remain. Since it is, and since it participates in the word, who is truly from the Father, and is aided by him to exist, and thus, and, and not thus suffer what would otherwise have happened, I mean a relapse into non-existence, were it not protected by the word, who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for through him, in him, all things subsist, things visible and invisible, he's the head of the church, as the servants of the truth teach in holy writings. So really interesting passage, goes from this creation, creation ex nihilo, always tending towards non-existence, but God enables it to um, remain in existence. It's like his fingerprints. He makes everything through the word, and his fingerprints, the word, is imprinted in the whole of creation in its, in its order and all the rest of it. But the order is now specifically that of the church. He's gone from creation to the church. The last line identifies the word is holding all things in existence as being the head of the body, his church. Yeah, so there's more going on than simply cosmological speculation about what happened at the beginning. Okay? He's looking at the whole of creation in the light of the cross. All things came into being for this. All things are tending back into non-existence. But he's impregnated the whole of creation with his rationality, which holds it in existence insofar as it remains within him. Okay, we'll leave uh, quotation number seven. <coughs> it's now actually, uh, it is right on 11... I'm happy to carry on talking. I, I, I carry on talking for the rest of the day. I, I enjoy talking. Um, but if we're going to follow the timetable, then this would probably be the best time to take a break, and then we can turn to On the Incarnation. Unless you all want to stay, and I'll just carry on talking. Okay, how long do we have? Ten minutes? Yeah, I think we'll be back for ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah, okay.